Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Upon all the earth, there is one spot an expedition like this could take place. We search for a strange and exotic creature, a creature so rare that his existence was unknown until 1960. A creature so specialized, there are only about 60,000 acres in the world that can sustain him. If we find him, you may not think he's pretty. To some, his looks are every bit as alien as his habits. Hi, I'm Doug Phillips, and no, we're not journeying into the wilds of some lost continent. We're here in an area of our planet Earth known as the Red Hills region of Alabama, and we're in quest of a little critter called the Red Hill Salamander. Join us on our intriguing venture to learn what the Red Hill Salamander can tell us about himself and what he might reveal about ourselves. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has escaped the hustle and bustle of modern civilization, a place with bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the natural wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to Discovering Alabama. Our search for the Red Hill Salamander has taken us into the Red Hills region of Alabama. More specifically, we're headed into the woods of northern Monroe County right now. This unusual creature lives in the Red Hills region between the Alabama River to the west and the Conecuh River to the east. If you've ever driven along I-65 south of Greenville, Alabama, you've driven through the heart of the salamander's territory. There's no fossil evidence that the Red Hill salamander has ever existed anywhere else in the world. I-65 is just one of the radical changes the creature's habitat has undergone since its discovery. Jeopardy to its habitat led to the Red Hill salamander being listed as a threatened species in 1976, a designation that continues to this day. But so what? Why should you or I care if we lose a species of salamander? It exists nowhere else in the world, so why would we miss it here in the Red Hills of Alabama? Good questions. As we explore the mysteries of the Red Hill salamander, maybe we'll uncover some answers. The Red Hill salamander, what the heck is that? A radial what? <laughs> what do I think of the Red Hill salamander? What is that, a fish or something? Well, I really don't know if they really exist. It's probably a salamander that lives in an area maybe called Red Hill. All salamanders are amphibians, a class that includes frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. Amphibians usually spend at least part of their lives in water. We all know about the little tadpole becoming a frog. Not so with the Red Hill salamander. This little creature is all terrestrial. It spends its entire life on land here in Alabama. This is number six. Or rather, it spends life under the Red Hills of Alabama. Perhaps this is why the Red Hill salamander was undiscovered until 1960. In 1960, a field biologist from Mississippi named Leslie Hubrick, who was, by all accounts, the all-time great authority on the land snails of the southeast was making a field trip through Alabama. He was driving down US 31 just north of McKenzie in Butler County when he noticed the steep bluffs above Persimmon Creek and the really pretty magnolias that were shading those bluffs and he thought this might be a promising place to collect some snails. So he pulled over and grabbed up a handful of leaves and under those leaves was not a snail but uh, 
a pretty interesting looking nine inch salamander that uh, he'd never seen before. He sent it off to the Smithsonian in uh, Washington and the significance of this really came to light about a year later when Dr. Richard Hyten at uh, University of Maryland described this as not only a new species, but he considered it so different that he placed it in a new genus, the genus Phagnathus. And he named it Phagnathus hubrichti after Leslie Hubricht, the discoverer. This animal is not only unique to Alabama in that it's the only member of this particular species in the state, but it's the only member of the whole genus uh, to be found anywhere. And again, it's, a, it's unique to this state. Uh, and because it's in its own genus, that tells you just morphologically and from its life history perspective, it's different from any other salamander anywhere out there. The Red Hill salamander was discovered actually by accident. An interest in the new find was quick to spread. Yet a second specimen was not found until March of 1963 when a team from Ohio State University discovered that the salamanders inhabit burrows on slopes. 217 is in the burrow. As late as 1970, the Red Hill salamander was still only known from two places, the original site in Butler County and one place nearby in Kanaka County. In 1970, Dr. Robert Mount at Auburn University and his student Terry Schwanner released the results of their research, which delineated the range of the salamander pretty much as we know it now, which includes Crenshaw, Covington, and Monroe counties as well. Then it was on a state in a state of decline. It was we pretty much demonstrated that, and this habitat was being destroyed, and uh, so it was proposed for a listing under the Endangered Species Act and uh, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service reviewed all the information and concurred and it was listed in 1976 as a threatened species. Well, we sort of have an innate fascination with things that are specialized. Uh, and from that perspective, again, I have no trouble getting students interested in this particular topic because the animal is so unusual and they want to know why it's unusual. That tells us uh, something about the world we live in that we're only going to know if we have specialized organisms around. So who we got? Good old number 36. Uh, this is a very large adult. This is close to the biggest one that I've seen since we started doing this. Uh, our suspicion is it's a big female. thing that students can take away from this project is an appreciation for animals in nature. It's unusual to be able to go out and get those kinds of field experiences in this day and age. Uh, and so we can provide that field experience that gives them not only the interest of understanding and seeing nature in action, but it also teaches them things like survey so techniques that are going to be important for understanding what biodiversity we do have left and how we're going to go about maintaining it. Nowadays, scientists must have special federal permits to collect Red Hill salamanders. And after spending a short time in the lab, the little fellows are carefully returned to their burrows. You know, like that one. Right and just like that. He's there you go. Yep. Home sweet home. The expedition we're traveling with tonight is releasing salamanders from a previous expedition and collecting others for further study. How do you know what you're looking for when you catch them? What do you do with them? Well, we find holes like this one that are smooth, oval, a little wider than they are tall. And then we'll hook them using small unbarbed hooks and uh, we put a, a cricket on it and kind of move it in front of it like it's a little animal in front of the burrow and they'll come right out and try and eat it. And then we can gently just pull them out of the burrow. Oh, oh look at that. That's what happens 95% of the time. 
When you take them back to the lab, what do you do? We put uh, pit tags in them, which allow us to recapture them later and use a pit tag reader to see if it's the same animal that's in the same burrow or if it's moving around to different burrows. That's a pretty young one. It's pretty small. So it's a new burrow this spring. Usually we try to get them out as far as you can before you let them take it because the more of their body that's still inside the burrow, the stronger grip they got. They got a really strong grip with their tail and body. Got him. Burrow number 20. He is new, no tag in him. At this point, we have only bits and pieces of information about how this animal operates in nature. We need things like how long they live, when they mate, how many okay. offspring they produce, uh, what they eat. All these things are virtually unstudied. While much of the study of the Red Hill Salamander takes place under cover of darkness, there's a lot to be learned by the light of day here in the Red Hills of Alabama. The story of the Red Hill Salamander is inseparable from the part of the state from which our rare critter takes its name. The salamanders are restricted to a particular geologic formation, or two actually, called the Tallahatta and the Hatchetigbee geological formations. And those formations have a stone that's very soft and very porous. It's called silt stone. Silt stone contains or holds water during the droughty periods. And during the winter, the silt stone becomes super saturated with water. And during the summer, in the hot dry periods, the silt stone contains enough moisture to enable a lot of critters that need the moisture to exist in, among those as the Red Hill Salamander. Uh, these are unusual in that they're also lungless salamanders. They have no lungs. They breathe through their skin. So these animals have to find a place that is moist enough that they can keep from drying out, uh, but that's also dry enough that they can get enough oxygen to breathe. The unusual terrain here in Alabama's Red Hills is further defined by its forests, which include many areas of aging hardwoods. Where these forests are undisturbed, they are some of the most appealing woodlands in the eastern United States, featuring great beech, oaks, hickories, and as many as five species of magnolia. The canopy and the falling leaves of this deciduous forest provide a rich, moist habitat. These moist conditions, along with the unique bluffs and soils of the Red Hills, create an ideal habitat for the Red Hill salamander, yet an environment as unfamiliar for many Alabamians as the creature itself. Today, the Red Hill salamander can be found in only about one-fourth of its original range. And this means that 75% of this magic part of the world has already been lost. The Red Hill Salamander became the first amphibian in the U.S. to be listed as a threatened species. To understand how it earned this distinction, it's necessary to understand a bit more about its home territory. We've already looked at the unique geology and forests of the region, but no appreciation of this part of the state would be complete without a look at the people and the economy of the Red Hills. Well, Tim was probably the biggest industry in Alabama. It uh, has a tremendous effect, especially the ripple effect. And uh, all the way from people like us that grow it to the finished product, it has a tremendous impact on the economy of Alabama. In 1975, Robert Mount and Ralph Jordan Jr determined that only about 63,000 acres of suitable habitat existed for the salamander. 
And of that, 44% was owned or leased by large paper companies. The industry has been working on issues like this one for, uh, for a good number of years, and, and our challenge is to, to mesh those things to, to, uh, to meet the, the objectives of, of landowners, of, of industry, of conservationists, of environmentalists, and all that, and, and try to certainly preserve these animals, but also preserve the other uses of the land that goes on around it. And I, I think, you know, we're seeing that. We're seeing companies like International Paper and Union Camp and Matt Mill and Blowdale kind of step up to the plate, if you will, and, and develop these conservation plans. With timber operations exercising control over the majority of the remaining Red Hill salamander habitat, Cooperation with the paper companies is essential to the creature's survival. Well, the salamander is, is, of course, it's part of the whole scheme of things, if you will, and, and what particular part that plays, you know, is probably not very well understood. There's a lot of work going on to try to understand it better, but the fact that, that it's there, it, it occupies a unique uh, habitat, uh, and, and it's just our responsibility as as responsible landowners and managers to protect those, those type things. In 1991, International Paper Company, which owns an estimated 12% of the salamander's entire range, initiated contact with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the purpose of developing a habitat conservation plan for the salamander. The Alabama Natural Heritage Program was contracted to do the field work and collect data for incorporating into this plan. The, uh Natural Heritage Program has gathered all of the biological data that's available and put it in one place so that we can serve as a clearinghouse of data for people that uh, want to uh, make conservation-based decisions on uh, development. If uh, uh, scientists want to uh, learn more about a species, they can uh, you know, come through us and, and get all the information that's in one place. While a number of large national and international timber operators are major players in the area, there are also local families and other private landowners who play a role. It basically costs us money. Um, you know, I am very much for saving endangered species and all that, but I really think uh, maybe, you know, they ought to, if you want to save it, you ought to be willing to pay for it. And, you know, we're a relatively small company and it's costing us a lot of money to save the salamander. There are a number of things that we have to think about to protect the salamander habitat. We can't use any mechanical site prep. We can't use herbicides within the zones. We can't drive heavy machinery within the optimal habitat. We can't have heavy harvest inside the habitats. The red tape of getting a permit is incredible. It took us, I think, almost four years, and we didn't harvest any of that land, and some of that land we had scheduled to harvest, and we got a tornado that uh, destroyed a lot of timber. So it ended up costing us a tremendous amount of money, simply the red tape of trying to to get the permit. When you're working between two or three or four people and one section's got to be authorized by this fellow and this fellow's got to authorize it by another fellow and it keeps going through channels and then all of a sudden somebody changes it then it's got to go back through the loop again. That's, that's difficult. Owners of smaller tracks also have a role in managing the lands inhabited by the Red Hill Salamander. They're certainly important and, and I think we've seen in the last few years a demonstration by the Fish and Wildlife Service and and other groups to work with these small landowners to develop management strategies for their properties that will allow them to, to uh, harvest some of their timber but at the same time protect Red Hill salamander habitat. So they, they're certainly important in this mix. When you get right down to it, very little is known about this critter. We don't even know what goes on down inside those burrows. But perhaps there's a way we can probe more deeply to find out. What uh, we've got here is called a video image scope. After checking around a bit, we reached Mike Bishop of Olympus America, who was able to provide us with a special video imaging scope. And it's kind of like endoscopic surgery. And what we've got in this video image scope is a uh, CCD chip. Why don't we see if we can find somebody in there? Mike, Craig Geyer, and Mark Bailey returned to the salamander site to see what they could discover. It's a uh, matter of you, you view and steer, sometimes twisting the scope a little bit. Oh, it's, it's 
It's amazing how well maintained it is in here. Oh, there we go. Now, where, where do you figure the orientation of this thing is? It's, it's exactly the way it's, we're looking at it. He's coming from up oh, above. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There he goes. He's coming from another passageway up above and going in. That is incredible. Wow. I can't believe that. <laughs> we should try to go down there farther now. What we've learned is that these animals probably move around a lot more than anybody suspected. We found that the burrow structure under the ground is much more complicated than anybody realized. They're branching hither and yon, uh, and it's probably the case that they're communicating with each other right there underground in fashions that are going to be difficult to study, but uh, clearly that allows them seemingly to move from spot to spot. Oh, there we go. The sculpt provided us a never seen before look inside the burrow of the Red Hill Salamander. Yet many mysteries remain about the life of this special creature. How long does it live? Nobody knows. What is its reproductive cycle? Nobody knows. Many other questions remain to be answered about the Red Hill Salamander, including our earlier question, so what? What do you or I care? if a species of salamander becomes extinct. If you've got one species on the threatened or endangered list, there may be a dozen others out there that are associated with that species that are not even on the list. It hasn't even been proposed because we know so little about them. So uh, these endangered species are kind of like the canary in the coal mine. They want us. If they're endangered species and once they're wiped out, we really don't know what purpose they serve on it on the planet towards mankind's good or bad. I think that if other people were saddened as much as I was, when, um, when you hear about things that were lost in the past, like the passenger pigeon or the Carolina parakeet or whatever, I mean, those animals, they're never gonna be here again. And it would be a shame for us to let that happen to an animal like this. Anything that's endangered ought to be uh, respected to some degree to make sure it doesn't leave the earth. I always think of it as, you know, we don't really own the land. We just kind of use it for a while during our stay. And, we basically want to leave it better than we found it. If we lose the Red Hill Salamander, it's because we're allowing ourselves to lose the unique natural community of which it is a member. And that to me would be an even greater tragedy. This is a beautiful and irreplaceable part of Alabama's natural heritage. It's something we have that no other state can claim. And it is a hotspot of biological diversity. It's amazing to consider that a creature like this could remain undiscovered until 1960. And it kind of makes you wonder, what else is out there waiting to be discovered? What will we discover? Discovering Alabama is a continuing adventure. Generations before us have pursued this adventure, as will generations to come and many of the secrets being uncovered start small. Like the tiny burrow of a fragile salamander in the side of a hidden forested bluff. Upon all the earth, there is but one spot this strange and exotic creature calls home. And that special place is in a land we call Alabama.
This program is supported by grants from the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, State Lands Division, the Alabama Wildlife Federation, working for wildlife since 1935, and Legacy, partners in environmental education.